OK, so in this lecture, we're going to cover WebSockets. So I'm going to have a little bit of an introduction, set the scene, um, then cover WebSockets. Then, as usual, I guess, I'm going to go through some example code in Java and JavaScript um, to explain how you can write WebSockets for yourselves. I'll demonstrate it with a simple echo server, echo WebSocket server, and then we'll show the real power of it, which is um, through this simple chat application. Run through a couple of issues, talk about Java implementations, and talk about how you might want to use it in your mini project. OK. So I did a lot of HTTP uh, last term, autumn term. And general idea is the client sends a get, a post, a put, or delete request, and the server responds you know, with some data or confirmation or whatever. But these are all client-initiated requests. It's not bidirectional. With the sockets, you've got the luxury of writing in either direction on a TCP socket. Um, but uh, with HTTP, it's just a client-initiated request. The server can't push data to the client. And this is, uh, this is fine for a lot of things. If you just want to pull some HTML or pull an image or whatever off a server, this is, all, this is absolutely perfect, right? But what if, what if you want to write a, an email application? where the client's sitting there um, and someone sends the client an email. But the client's, the email's going to be sent to the server and the server needs to somehow tell the client that an email's been received. So you need some method of telling the client um, that there's new data on the server that the client needs to, to, update, to, to request or update. Or, you know, chat, right? Google's Gmail or whatever's got this nice chat built in. Facebook's got chat. You know, how, how's that going to work? How is the client going to know that... Um, that someone else has sent them a message as part of a chat conversation. So the bidirectional thing is very handy for these kind of chats, email, these kind of stuff. Um, but, and so how can, how can you handle that with HTTP? So traditionally, there's been two ways in which you can address this. Um, firstly, uh, you can just constantly make a request for new, send lots and lots of free, many, many requests uh, for new data, like using Ajax or something like that. So if we're doing with the email example, um, the client will sit there with JavaScript, and every second, say, the, the client will send a, an XML HTTP request to the server, like, is there any more data? And then the server will send back any more emails that have arrived. Of course, that's going to be quite expensive in terms of using up lots of the client's resources, as well as using up the server's resources um, as they process all these requests. Slightly better solution is what's called HTTP long polling, um, where the client sends a request to the server, but the server doesn't just doesn't respond immediately. Instead, they keep the connection open and send the response when they've got new data. And so the client sends a get for its email, let's say. The server just sits there, sits there, and when a new email comes in, it then replies to the, to the client's request. And once the client receives the response, it then immediately sends another, um, another request. So this is nice and efficient in the sense that um, the client's only sending requests for more, the server's only responding, sending data back to the client or responding to client's requests when it actually has more information. It's not got this constant update cycle of sending endless, endless extra requests. So I think parts of Facebook use that. I think Gmail used to use that. I don't know what it uses now. Um, and this is sometimes called Comet, this HTTP long polling. So it's not bad. Um, probably a few disadvantages to it. Um, so it's got a fair amount of overhead. I think that's, you know, so you've got to open and close the connections. Uh, for HTTP, um, so you've always, for every bit of data you receive, you've got to have a, a header, you've got to open and close the connection. It's not great for low latency with HTTP because it's running over TCP, right? Um, so browser-based games and stuff, you know, long polling, you know, if two people running on separate computers, probably long polling is not ideal. And this is, these limitations of long polling and frequent AJAX requests um, have led to the development of web sockets which I must say is rather nice technology. So we're going to explain how you can do it. So WebSockets is great. It's like low latency, near, re near real-time connection between the client and server. So what, what you're getting pretty much for TCP or UDP. But the great advantage over HTTP is that it can, both the client and the server can initiate communication once connection is established. And, you know, blessed relief, you don't have this cross-origin communication business. So with JavaScript, you're limited. You can't make... Um, if a server serves up a JavaScript file or whatever, 
then that JavaScript can't make a request to another server um, without some rather ugly hacks. Um, so, it, but with this WebSockets, you know, if I'm running on one domain, my JavaScript running on my from my domain can communicate no problems using WebSockets with another domain. So it's it's great. I mean, you can limit the you can add security if you want, but it's not built into the protocol. So you can so it's much more flexible in that sense. Um, yeah, and uh, okay. So the main of so so it's. Advantage of a sockets is that it runs over HTTP. So it is an HTTP sort of protocol, but it's very close to the actual um, sockets. It's just a sort of little layer on top of TCP that's as close as possible to exposing TCP to script or JavaScript in this case. And so you can add the web origin based security model for browsers um, if you want. And um, yeah, so you can run multiple services on one port and multiple host names on one IP address. So it essentially allows you to have socket connections running over HTTP, which doesn't create any problems with the firewalls, any of that. So it's, it's just an HTTP, such a nice ubiquitous protocol. It's great that you can just sit on top of that, this, this bi-directional communication. Sit this bi-directional communication on top of the HTTP protocol. So how it works is it um, starts with a handshake, and then we have the actual data protocol. So the handshake, um, the client sends this HTTP upgrade request. So it requests to upgrade the WebSocket, and this is like part of the HTTP, just a little bit hacky sort of fix on top of it. And it says it's requests an upgrade, and then the reply from the server says, yes, it's all right, we're going to upgrade you. Then it can, the server can choose to allow or deny certain requests from certain origins. So this is the control of security, which can be added or not added, depending on what you want to do. And then the server, then in, and then we have the, um, the handshake. So the client sends the request to the server, and the server has to prove that it received this collection from this um, particular client. So it prevents, what does it prevent? So if we had, so the server has to show that that client requested that, made the request for the connection. So you don't want uh, the server to be able to initiate connections with other clients, I suppose. Um, that haven't requested um, a WebSocket connection, which would allow, you know, potentially allow the server to do nefarious things to other clients, I guess. I guess that's the main point. So the clients, so we have to prove it's the clients sending some sort of little, a bunch of data, the server's manipulating that data to prove to the client um, that it did actually rec receive the request from the client. So they can check that, you know, that they're, the pe only the people who want to connect are connected, essentially. So what the client says is two keys. So it says WebSocket key one and WebSocket key two in the, in the upgrade request that sends the server. And then the server responds with a particular way of particular, it processes these in a very carefully defined way, which I'll quickly explain, and sends back the, the response of this, pro the, the outcome of this processing back to the client. So for example, the client might send these two keys here. What the server does, it extracts the digits to form two numbers, in this case, these two numbers here, it divides the numbers by the number of spaces, and the client request also includes this third eight-byte number in the client request. You get this 128-bit string from all this processing, and the server sends an MD5 sum of string back to the client. So if the client received, um, so if the server got this wrong, or a different server sent it, you know, sent back a response, an upgraded response, um, then the client will reject the WebSocket connection because it was spurious or from a different origin or it didn't ask for it, right? It'd be like someone, someone just, would just be contacting it, trying to connect to it, rather than it being a response to a connection that it initiated. So this WebSocket stuff has to be initiated by the client, but once it's initiated and the connection's established, they can then talk to each other in a bi-directional way. But you don't, want to, you don't want the server to be able to start up the whole connection in the first place because then someone else could try and connect to the client using this, using this mechanism. So that's what this protocol is to ensure that the client only establishes connection with servers that when, it's, it, when it has initiated that connection. So URLs have their own little WS to indicate that it's a WebSocket connection. So instead of HTTP, you have WS or WSS if it's a secure WebSocket connection. So this kind of stuff's great for multiplayer online games, chat applications, live sports, right? If you want to have the sports results pouring into your computer, um, then this would be a good way because again, the data is updated on the server, 
and then the server can push that data to the client. Real-time social media streams, Internet of Things. So I'm going to talk um, in the last lecture in this series, I'm going to talk about uh, Nest and how they use, um, how devices in the home communicate, um, have their set send their settings to the cloud and send their status to the cloud and update their settings from the cloud. And this is done using, using WebSockets or, as well as other methods if WebSockets isn't working, but WebSockets is the default and best method for doing this. So great for the Internet of Things, great for multiplayer online games, great for e email, all kinds of things. It's a very handy um, protocol. So now I'll just talk through a little bit about how it works, give you a little bit of an overview, show you kind of how you can run your own uh, WebSockets um, at home. So most modern browsers support WebSockets, so, you know, such as Chrome, and you can use JavaScript to send and receive the data to them. You can also use WebSockets for Java and other programming languages. You just need a third-party library to do that. So I'm going to focus on using JavaScript, talking to a server um, written in Java. Um, but you can, and the Java and the server will be like a sort of um, endpoint within Glassfish, not the actual standalone server. But there's lots of different ways of doing this. And so I'll give you some implementations at the end you can use if you want a pure Java solution or want a standalone Java server. So this is the JavaScript. So we got, um, this is taken from an example, I think I've given a link to on the course website. So we have start the connection in JavaScript. And then this connection has a series of different events associated with it. So when connection is opened, then this function is executed, which sends like a ping message to the server. And then we have on error, which puts an error message. And then whenever a message comes from the server, then this connection on message function is triggered, which, uh, which uh, gets this paragraph and changes the content, updates, changes that content to what's been received from the server. So that's the connection. This is like, a, this is not mine. This shows you that the cross-origin stuff works because I can run this locally. And this connects, this is like uh, the URL from the ex Echo Server example. Someone gave this example code, which, which is good, a link to on the course website. And, um, and so we're using their, we're making a WebSocket connection to their site, not, not to our site. And then, yeah, this is the stuff that's handling the actual different, different methods, different uh, events generated by our WebSocket connection and modifying that. So this is what it looks like. You sort of, when you execute it, doesn't do much. It just connects to the WebSocket, sends that, and this is the reply from the server. Um, yes, yeah, so using the WebSocket.org echo server, you may have problems with the proxy server. I'll cover this later. And the... There's an example there, a slightly more polished Echo server. I'll give you a bit more polished example in a bit. So that's very roughly how the client side works. And you can see it's like dead easy, just a few lines of JavaScript, and there's your WebSocket up and running. Now we're going to talk about the server side, also dead easy. Um, now you can do this in two ways. You can have a, a server that has, just handles the WebSocket request. It understands the protocol. It can you know, mash, mash up the numbers in the right way and send back the appropriate response. So you can just have a standalone server. You could probably just write one, um, you know, using the Java HTTP server. But the easier way to do this is create an endpoint managed by an existing server, such as Glassfish. So this is the dead easy way to do it. You know, NetBeans yet again comes to the rescue and enables us to create a really easy um, WebSocket endpoint. And so what happens is you, the, when the client sends the WebSocket request to Glassfish, Glassfish then routes the WebSocket traffic to and from the endpoint that it itself is managing. So we'll explain that how to do that. It's very easy to create this in NetBeans. You just create a new project, select Java Web, Web Application. So we create a new project. So firstly, you need to inf install all the appropriate bits of NetBeans. There's like stripped down versions that appear Java, and there's ones that have a, the web, HTML, and all that, and there's ones that have the enterprise edition. Make sure you install all of them if you're installing this on your home computer. So we select Java Web, Web Application, give it a name, all that sort of stuff. Um, blah blah. Make sure this, make make sure you install the server as well when you run install NetBeans. And so then we've got our web application when we click finish. Then we right click on the source packages and select new WebSocket endpoint. So here's our web application, all the bits and bobs it comes with. We right click on source packages, new WebSocket endpoint. We're probably going to have to give it a package name. We're going to have to give it a class name. And then we click, and this is the URL, URL Universal Resource Identifier. Um, and this demo endpoint is the, 
what's what the sort of end bit of the URL that will cause it to be redirected to this to this endpoint. So whenever we type in like localhost or whatever, we need to add at the end demo endpoint, and then it'll reach this endpoint because that's what Glassfish will handle this last bit and make sure it's directed to the appropriate class. So we create our endpoints, click finish, and we get up, end up with this class. Very, very easy. Um, and all we have is our public class. That's just a sim simple class. It's got this annotation. So server endpoint, that specifies that it's a server endpoint. And this is like, and that's the URL for this, end, for this server endpoint. And then what we do is we override the different parts. Again, we're using the annotations. And on message means that whenever an on message message is received, Whenever a message is received, and we execute this particular method, and we can, and there's lots of different, and we can override or use annotation um, to indicate, you know, what each of these methods is doing. So if you just leave the sort of defaults, that's probably the easiest thing. So it's a bit like the JavaScript. So whenever on, whenever a message is received, as long as you've got on message here, then this method will be executed on open. Whenever the WebSocket connection is open, it'll do whatever you like. On close, same, and on error. So this is the best starting point. So once you've created your endpoint, add these in, add a little bit of like output just so you can see what's going on, and then we can test it. So what's this doing? So for on message here, this is an echo, echo endpoint. So it's printing out what the message is, and it's returning. Uh, and what you return here gets sent back to the client. So what we're just returning is your message was plus the message. So we're just echoing back the message that was sent by the client back to the client. And then to run it, we just run it in project in NetBeans. That deploys the endpoint on the server and, start, and starts the server. And then you should be able to connect to it using a simple uh, client. So I've given you this simple client um, with this sort of rather lousy messages thing or whatever. I think I've given you a better client as well. So this is exactly the same as the client I explained earlier. And that's this. But that's not exactly the client. Uh, this is a slightly more sophisticated version of the client, which I've included as well in the example code. So I'll just show you, show you it working. Okay, so on the server side, here we have, let's just get rid of that for the moment. Here we have our index. This is our slightly more sophisticated client, I think. And then we've got um, index, yep. We've got the source packages here. Got a package name, and we've got the web service endpoint here. And this is all part of the WebSocket one web application. So all we do is click on play. And get my output. Right, there we go. So the Glassfish server, with a bit of luck, it's all started. It's deployed my WebSocket. Then we can go to the there. So here's our slightly more sophisticated. Um, client, and we can tick it, type in like hello uh, end point, click on submit, and for some reason it hasn't deployed. It's just, yeah, there we go, right. So, type, just need a refreshing. So, just type in the message. Blah, blah blah blah, submit, and it sends it to the server, and the endpoint's just echoing it back, and it's being received by the client. And what we have is a bi-directional communication between JavaScript running in the browser and the endpoint running in Glassfish. Okay, so that was all sort of easy peasy enough, right? And as I said, yeah, we've got a better JavaScript client, so that it's just a bit more bells and whistles, so we got a little... Uh, like a slightly more styling on the paragraph to make it, you know, to give it this, uh, put a little box around it and this kind of stuff. And it's working exactly the same way, opening the WebSocket and sending, when you click on submit, it sends a message uh, to using the connection. And when a message is received, it just updates it on the, <coughs> updates it in the browser. So with um, WebSockets, um, you're creating a new endpoint for each connection. So you have a separate endpoint handling separate connections from all the different clients. 
Um, and that's all fine. Sometimes that's great. If all your endpoint's doing is pushing data to or from a database or whatever, that's you know, sweet and peachy. However, um, we might want our clients to be able to communicate with each other, right? And one way you can do this is have static variables um, on the server that coordinate multiple clients. Probably going to be issues with thread safety because you know, the, the endpoints are going to be executing their code in response to the client's requests. And if they're both trying to access the same object, you might need to do some synchronization going on. And there's a nice example here that sort of illustrates how that works. But how you do this is so we have the class demo web service endpoint, and we have a static string here, history. And then we can just add the message to the history. And then all of the clients will be able to see this, um, this history all of the clients running on that particular instance of that server. OK, so that's a very simple how do you start with endpoints kind of, um, kind of section. And now we can go on to show some of the real power of, um, not endpoint, of web sockets. So the echo example would have been dead easy. We could have written that with a servlet. We could have written it with whatever we like. You know. It's not very exciting, right? could easily build it with standard HTTP methods because you could have just gone get and the response could have just contained our message. We're not adding anything with the web, with the web socket stuff. There's no pushing of data to the client. Instead, I'm going to use, um, but I will illustrate now, the power of web sockets um, by showing you how to build a simple chat application. So with very little extra code, we can build you know, something that enables people to chat online. So this is the idea. So we've got the simple chat application. We type in the messages. And the messages that I've sent are like gray with like me in front. And the messages that I've received are like here, um, like in black. So I'll give you a demo of this. And here we have our two, two chats. So I'll refresh them. And hopefully it'll work. So let's, let's say. Hello, I am John. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Let's try again. Yeah. Ah. That's why, because we're not in the chat bit. So these are on chat HTML. Right, so let's refresh them. Okay, so let's just start again. So, hello, I am John. So this is the message we're sending to it. And so it's echoing the message that I've sent, like with this gray formatting. And then this other client here receives the message, hello, I'm John. And uh, hello, John, I am Tony. So he sends a message. And so you can see that uh, this message then is sent to this client and up to this client, and we're using the push power of WebSockets so that when this message is sent to the server, this message is then being pushed um, to this client here. Okay. So here's the HTML JavaScript. So again, here we've got a chat endpoint, slightly different because we've got a slightly different class at the other end, being run on the server. Most of the rest is the same. We just got message history. Haven't I've hardly changed a thing to make this into a chat client instead of uh, just an echo client. And then the server endpoint is pretty easy as well. All we have is all we have is uh, it's in, in this case we're using a different endpoint, chat endpoint. And the key bit that makes this all possible is we've got what's called peers here. So whenever we open a connection, this is a static. Uh, variable. So whenever we, whenever we open a connect, whenever a client opens a connection with the, with the server, we add the information about that client to this peers variable. And whenever a client closes a connection, we remove that peer from this list of peers here. And then when we receive a message from one of the peers, um, we echo that message back to all of the peers. But depending on whether, but with the peer that sent the message, we style that message with gray. And with the, peer, the other peers, we style that message with black. So that's why we're getting the gray styling and the me colon with the message. Whereas if you didn't send the message, it just appears in black. So the clients are connecting, and the details about that connection to the clients are being stored statically. Because it's stored statically, any of the other, client, any of the other endpoints can also access that information. 
And whenever a client sends a message, um, it's echoed back to all of the peers, all of the other connected clients, um, but, it's a, uh, but the formatting's changed so that the client, so it's like gray with me if it's the client that sent, if it's being echoed back to the client that sent the message, or it's black um, if it's being echoed back to a different client. So I think, so that's what's, that's what's doing the power here of the me, Helen, David. It's not client side, it's server side determining the formatting of the message. Okay. Ah, oh, so even a, even a synchronized set. How about that for thread safety, eh? So yeah, and that's what that's doing. Okay. So with a few extra lines of code, I've produced a chat application that will run across the internet, um, and it's got all the push power. It doesn't have any HTTP long polling, any of that mess. It's just straight and clean. So you can see a hope from that um, that WebSockets can be, can be very useful. So just run through a couple of issues though. So there are some issues with proxy servers and some potential issues with server performance. So WebSockets are using the HTTP upgrade system to upgrade the request, uh, upgrade the HTTP connection to a WebSocket connection. This is normally used for HTTP SSL. That's what I meant about it being a little bit hacky. So some proxy servers will drop this connection. So it just won't work if you're trying to operate this over a proxy server. You get this error if you look in the debugging console on Chrome. You get like WebSocket connection to bloody blah, blah, establishing a tunnel via proxy server failed. So proxy servers might mess this all up. So if you're using a WebSocket library, it's possible that they'll have a workaround to handle this problem with proxy servers and use a different protocol if WebSockets fails. So the Socket IO library um, is like enables you to use WebSockets. So Socket IO, I think, is um, JavaScript, server side JavaScript library, um, and it uses WebSockets. Um, and it supports WebSockets, but if the WebSockets falls over and dies, um, it can fall back to long polling to, to facilitate the communication. There might also be some performance issues. So with standard HTTP, the server doesn't maintain connections, so it just connects, apply, forgets completely about the client. So opens connections, receives connections, receives blah, blah, blah. But with WebSockets, you've got connections with the clients remaining open, and if you've got tens of thousands of clients connected, um, that could create a, a big, potentially a big issue. So you either got to do a little bit of processing on each one of the sockets simultaneously to maintain all this input and output with all these different clients, or you have this kind of clever, uh, well, that's, that'd be more of the threading solution, or you have this non-blocking IO, so it works its way through each of the connections in sequence. It doesn't wait for input and output. So the problem with this is if you're maintaining 5,000 Connections of, connections of 5,000 clients. Um, you might have to wait, you might have a blocking wait or receive on each of those connections. And so you can handle that with 5,000 threads, for example, but that's going to be quite processor in, intensive, quite resource intensive. Or you can have this non-blocking I.O. where the processor checks each of the 5,000 connections in sequence for any kind of action from the client and then responds to that possibly with a separate thread um, if it detects any activity. So you don't want to waste resources waiting for input and output on a single connection. Okay. So in this lecture, I've tried to give you the most stripped down, simple version of WebSockets. And that's relying on JavaScript in the browser and NetBeans beans endpoints implemented in Java running Glassfish. As you can see, it required almost no effort to get it running and, um, and it worked very beautifully. In the real world, you're probably going to be situations where you want a client implemented in Java and a more flexible server. And so you might want to have a, one of the WebSocket implementations in Java or possibly another language. So there's lots of Java WebSocket implementations, like Grizzly, Jetty, Tyrus, Java WebSocket, and a sort of full and longer list there. So this will enable you to create a WebSocket client in Java and possibly a WebSocket server in Java, like a standalone server in Java, rather than a, a server that relies on being an endpoint that's um, being deployed in NetBeans, in Glassfish, sorry. There's other implementations in other languages. So um, Socket.io looks pretty good. It's got Java, JavaScript in both server and client, and nice fallback mechanisms. So I recommend looking at that if that's the sort of thing that might appeal. And there's other implementations listed there. So you know, there's lots of ways in which you can get this running. I've just given you one example of how that could work. As usual, I put the example code on the course website for you to adapt, you know, examine, use, and so on. And just say a little bit about how you might want to use WebSockets in Mini Project 2. So as I said in the spec, 
Um, you cannot use HG, standard HTTP methods in your, mini, in your second mini projects. This was all part of the autumn term studies. Um, it's not part of the spring term. Okay, so if you implement your online game using HTTP, get, post, etc., then you'll get no marks for it. But you can use WebSockets. I'm teaching WebSockets this term, and you can use WebSockets in your second mini projects. But it only really makes sense if you're like Mr. HTTP or Miss HTTP, and you really want to like get down with every single tiny aspect of HTTP. Or another scenario would be maybe you want to build the graphical interface in JavaScript and use WebSockets to communicate with a Glassfish server. That could work, right? Because JavaScript's got lots of nice libraries for drawing graphics, doing chats. You know, you might be quite good at JavaScript and enjoy using that for your graphical for your interface. Then no problem at all. I don't mind in the least if you use, produce the GUI in JavaScript, use WebSockets to talk to a server, and have the endpoints implemented in the server. So let's suppose you wanted to build a chess game as your online game. One way in which you could do this is uh, using a static chess class. You might have to do a bit of fiddling around with peers if you're going to support more than two users. But this is roughly how it works. Here's your super flash JavaScript chess class. Probably wouldn't be that hard to build. Um, and that's using WebSockets to send messages to these endpoints running on the Glassfish server. And then you have a static chess class. And these endpoints then change the state of this chess class, static chess class and then uh, when there's a change in that state, it can update all the different peer, all the peers and send the changes back to the, back to the clients. So it's a bit like the chat application. You might have to have a, also a static peer, a list of peers similar to the chat application. Because all it's doing is sending messages. So as long as you've got your static chess class to record the state of the game, um, then this should work. And you can make this work in a similar way to the, it'd be a bit like the multiplayer tic-tac-toe, except not necessarily with more than two players in the sense that you'd have three copies of the game, there'd be a cl two client-side copies and a server-side copy, and they'd be sending messages to update the state of the game. So this would be one way in which you could do min WebSockets and Mini-Project 2, and I'm happy for you to do that if you want. Okay, so just to wrap it up, um, WebSockets is beautiful bidirectional communication, sort of over HTTP, the kind of extension of HTTP, work over standard HTTP ports, so you're not going to have all these problems with firewalls, opening firewalls, blah, blah, blah. From the, from the, hopefully, from the router and the firewalls point of view, it'll just look like a standard HTTP upgrade request, which it should allow through. Next lecture, I'm going to talk about how HTTP can be used to stream audio and video, all about media streaming.